Jonathan has a question for you. I'm gonna unmute. Yeah, uh, what's up, Jay? Um, basically, like, um, w would you say that all humans share, like, an essence, like, one essence? Uh, yes, all humans share uh, human nature. Okay, yeah. Because um, then I want, like, because I, I almost want to apply this to the Trinity, because when we talk about all humans sharing one essence, that es the, the essence that we share isn't itself personal, it's impersonal, right? We're the persons that are distinct from the essence. So would you say that the because in the trinity the three persons all share one essence is the essence itself personal or is it only personal in virtue of the three persons that are distinct from the essence and that's really my question it's only personal in virtue of the three persons and that's what the meaning in hypostatize is in hypostatize is used by saint cyril and subsequent church fathers uh, up into saint uh, saint maximus and saint john damascus all the way up into saint Gregory palamas consistently to mean that very thing that nature exists in and only in the mode of persons. The Eastern Fathers also consistently apply the analogy of one essence and uh, hypostasis and the nature of person distinction in the Trinity to humans. They actually do apply that analogy pretty consistently while always pointing out, of course, that there's a dissimilarity because humans are individual separate beings from one another, even though they share a common nature, but their, their individuality makes them separate beings. It's different in the Trinity because the Trinity exists in a mode of being that humans do not. They are not separate. Right. So because of perichoresis, each of those persons perfectly and fully indwells one another. And so they have a... Uh, Without losing the distinction, hypostatically, Absolutely, obviously. right. And the reason that they don't lose that distinction is because we distinguish the persons on the basis of hypostatic properties. And the, the, the where we start our Trinitarian theology is the hypostatic property of the Father as the sole cause in our case. So personhood... The personhood of the Father is the source and sole arche of the Godhead. And that's why we don't start with essentialism uh, like the West tends to do, especially in the later uh, post-Augustinian Latin period. Uh, this right. The, the uh, late medieval, early medieval uh, Latin theological Trinitarian debates are almost always dominated by beginning with the presupposition of an absolutely simple usia. And it's simplicity and how you can reason to it from uh, natural theology. So you're correct, uh, and that's why it's very important to understand St. Cyril's Christology, because the inhypostatic principle that is applied to the triad is what St. Cyril applies to Christ when he becomes incarnate. So when we consider Christ's human nature in itself, it is impersonal, but in terms of being incarnate, it's not impersonal because it has for its personhood the divine person of the Logos. Right. Um, because I, I noticed that, it, you know, obviously when you read the Bible, it refers to God as a as he. So is that referring whenever we say God is a he, are we refer like do the three persons sort of share a collective um, he, so to say, or are we always referring to God, the father, or God, the son in, in specific? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's actually the triad. So the but the mode in which the triad speaks or acts or does is always in common. It's just that the each of the persons has a unique role. Uh, in those triadic actions. So every action of God is from the Father through the Son and the Spirit. That includes uh, the eternal energies from all, all eternity, like the God uh, radiating his divine glory from all eternity is from the Father through the Son and the Spirit. The action of creating the world is from the, fa from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And then the uh, work of redemption is also consistently from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And that's why different hypostases in redemption do different things. They take on different roles, even though there's one common action of God in every one of those uh, events or every one of those actions. So, for example, the second person of the Godhead is who became incarnate, not the Father and not the Spirit. So the Son is able to enter into a mode of being in existence that the other two hypostases do not. And so we think that only Orthodox theology really provides the, the means and the conceptual framework as to how theologically that's possible. In the Roman Catholic scheme, in terms of its dogma of absolute divine simplicity, we don't see how they could consistently say that absolute divine simplicity is true and at the same time that one hypostasis enters into time and space in a mode of being that the other two do not. So, correct. Uh, and, and by the way, it's important to understand that not only is nature in hypostatized, meaning that it exists in the mode or tropos of persons, the actions and energies of God are also in hypostatic. So, we, there's no generic essentialism in terms of our triadology. All of the energies of God are personal, meaning that they're in hypostatized. They all come to us from the Father, through the Son, and the Spirit. 
Yeah, Uh, because I was reading through and real quick, uh, like some and Van Til seems to say that he has this really wacky view that the Trinity is both one that God is both one person and three persons. What do you think about that conclusion? Correct. Van Til uh, accurately saw the problem in absolute divine simplicity in the Western view because he wanted to avoid essentialism and impersonalism. This is the critique that the Greek fathers and the Orthodox Church makes of the West in essence. Van Til saw that, but the problem is that Van Til was still working from within the framework of Augustinianism. So he had a uh, absolute divine simplicity, divine exemplarism view that Augustine had, and he didn't understand Orthodox theology. So precisely because he doesn't have the accurate nature-person distinction, and as a result of that, the essence-energy distinction that the Orthodox Church has, uh, Van Til had no solution, but he did have the correct analysis of the problem. Yeah, it's almost like uh, orthodoxy or the, I guess, the essence energy distinction in particular and the wit and like all that sort of would have completed Van Til's apologetic. Yes, I make that argument many times. And that's, in fact, what will be uh, part of the book that I'm working on right now with Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias. Um, And so Van Til understood that there needed to be, uh, there's not an, uh, uh, an impersonal essence that we have a contact with in God, that we only have contact with God who is a personal God. But he also didn't understand the monarchia of the Father. He didn't understand that the Father is the sole cause of the Godhead. And I think if he had understood that, he would have had a much better um, Trinitarian theology. Thanks for answering that, Jeff. You bet.